Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I just finished writing this talk, and I'm a little jet lagged, so <laughs> bear with me. Uh, but since I saw you last, I accidentally stumbled into another multi year project, <laughs> which is becoming a bit of a habit, but you know, I'll, I'll see where I go next. Um, but this is Wild World. It is drawn with colored pencil and pen. It took three years full time, and it has 1,642 animals to be exact. Uh, it's fundamentally, it's my take on a physical world map, uh, a natural world map, perhaps. So I only finished it two months ago, and since then, my life has accelerated into a whirlwind of intense work, preparing prints, releasing them on pre-order, making a comprehensive animal guide booklet, which was almost my breaking point, <laughs> and then shipping all of these prints around the world just in time for me to make it here. So uh, I'm going to tell you what I can about Wild World, but it is a complicated topic because, um, well, I've been immersed in the trees for three years, and now I'm going to try to tell you about the forest. Um, and in a way, I'm too close to it. Like, I feel like I've just returned from a, an epic journey, dazed, uh, battered, changed. Um, and uh, as it is with art, it's not necessary for the artist to explain everything either, or even possible. You know, they don't know the answers. It's kind of up to you now to interpret what I've made, because honestly, uh, it's a mystery to me that I just devoted three years of my life uh, to an idea, to an instinct, and all of a sudden this world map exists. So where do I even begin? Well, I could start here, where I actually began. Um, a little boy, five years old, uh, obsessed with maps, obsessed with New Zealand native birds. Um, thankfully, my whales have improved a little bit since then. <laughs> uh, I, was, uh, I was lucky to grow up in Aotearoa's South Island uh, it's a place that constantly impresses upon you the grandeur of nature. Now, I saw mountains and rivers, along with our native flora and fauna, as the, as the purest spiritual essence of my surroundings. So maps of nature have long been on my mind. Here's another one from about age 15. Um, so I think it's fair to say that Wild World has been a long time coming. Um, and over the years, I've had many map adventures, uh, maps dense with cities, maps on refrigerators, but my biggest dream of all was always a wild world map. Um, and then early in the pandemic, I had a lot of time on my hands and a hunger to escape my house and see the world. And so I realized this was my chance. So I went with the natural earth projection. Thank you, Tom, for your help choosing that. Um, I love the shape of the continents. Uh, the exaggeration of the high latitudes is, is not too bad. You know, centered on 11 east, cutting through the Bering Strait, all of that. It's a nice projection. And then with the natural earth data, I printed it out to the drawing size and stapled it to the back of my art paper. So with this, I could trace coastlines, rivers, topography uh, with a light pad. Um, because this is not just a compendium of wildlife, it's a very detailed physical world map. I want it to be that kind of resource as well. Um, so a high standard of accuracy was important. And once it was set up, the magic could begin. I started in Alaska, and that grizzly bear with a mouthful of salmon is the very first animal drawn on the map. That's number one of 1642. <laughs> and I didn't have a plan exactly. My plan was just like, physical world map of animals, go. But as it is with long form projects, they have a way of evolving. You know? Rather than me leading the map, I, it was the map leading me. Uh, and the research intensified. I was uh, overwhelmed by just the amount of species on the planet. It made selection very difficult. So I needed some rules. Um, I always gravitate towards the beautiful, unique, the iconic, the endemic. Um, but I did settle on these three particular criteria, which came to shape the philosophy of the map. Um, all animals are wild, native, and extant, so not extinct. Wild and native animals, they invoke natural biomes only, you know, pristine habitats without domesticated or introduced species, the kind of natural foundation that evolution and Mother Earth produced. Meanwhile, the extant animals set the map in the present day, and this is crucial. Wild world is a place that still exists. Um, it can still be cherished, it can still be protected. You know, it might seem an idealistic view of Earth, but it shows nothing that isn't there. Uh, it, I just want, uh, you know, every species, every habitat, it's still with us. I want this map to inspire hope, uh, to show just how wild the world still is, how much there is left to preserve. Because words cannot capture how incredible this planet is. It's a world teeming with life, it's spectacularly beautiful, and we're very lucky to call it home. 
Uh, but amidst all these millions of species, there is one that's become a very transformative, often destructive force, and that's Homo sapiens. So here's a world without us. Now, many world maps tell our geographic story, a planet color-coded into nations, overwhelmed with cities and roads, and these layers are important. But it's not the only way to envision Earth, because the foundational layer beneath is nature. Mountains, deserts, forests, ice, ocean, and millions of species of which we are but one. So here's my map of nature rather than nations. Now, we'll jump in, oh, there's Europe. Um, we're going to jump in a little bit to a few details and see what we find. And given the location, let's start with North America. Uh, Pittsburgh is somewhere between the wild turkey and the gray fox. Uh, you can see West Virginia's Seneca Rocks just below, a painted turtle up in Michigan. Um, I mean, there are hundreds of animals drawn across the continent, from pronghorns to pygmy rabbits in Nevada, alligator snapping turtle, arctic bumblebee, you know. But I want to highlight the landscapes for a second, uh, because the scenery of the American West was a really good place to experiment with my ultimate vision of a map, one in which the landscapes feel local and emotionally alive, like landscape art does, but they still maintain their geographic foundations. Waterfalls, rock formations, flowers, and trees, they all bring geography to life. I dismissed any concern about relative scale, uh, embracing a bison the size of the Rockies, or a desert tortoise that could crush LA. <laughs> because, like, why not, you know? I realized none of this mattered. No one's using my map to land a plane or plan their wilderness hike. At least I hope not. <laughs> Find your drinking water by the colossal kangaroo rat. Um, but it's always good to ask, like, what might your map actually be used for? Because then you start to see your creative opportunities. Uh, so yeah, let the Colorado River flow past Utah's delicate arch and get swallowed by the Grand Canyon. Let the Sierra Nevada open like a window onto Yosemite Valley beyond, beyond the shoulder of a condor. I just felt so free drawing this map, you know? Uh, partly because it has no cities or borders to worry about, it's always nice. Uh, but also free with the landscapes, using iconic peaks to compose a mountain range instead of attempting something more literal. It's a map made of moments. Uh, in the ocean, that sense of freedom just continues. Um, amongst the deep blue bathymetry, the line between land and sea is blurred. We've got coral next to trees, fish next to soaring seabirds. You know, and the map has a logic that seems, seems to allow for this. So why not? You know, the, land between, the line between land and sea is much fuzzier than we often appreciate. It's why I like bathymetry. It kind of shows archipelagos as the mountaintops that they are. And I just, I got frustrated being unable to draw iconic mountains on small islands because they didn't fit. And then I just decided to draw them anyway. And it all started to work, you know. Let's do the volcanic plugs of Bora Bora, or the peaks of Tahiti, or uh, Tiere, uh, towering over the Canary Islands. You know, that sense of artistic freedom and possibilities that flowed from this map has been really beautiful. Um, and the ocean was a lot of fun. It's, it's often a void on a map, you know, a watery non-place. Uh, and I did wonder if I'd run out of species uh, to draw across it, but uh, no. Just like everywhere else, I was constantly determining what not to draw because the options were too many. It's a world teeming with life, and I also learned a great rule about evoking watery depths. When in doubt, draw an anglerfish. <laughs> um, now, I took special interest in mountains on the map, which really expanded while drawing Asia because here you're confronted with the Tian Shan, the Pamirs, the Karakoram, the Himalaya, these are the highest mountains on Earth, and it was intense drawing animals amongst this kind of geography. Uh, you know, previously my mountain ranges were often a collection of prominent peaks amidst a lot of stock mountains. Um, but that changed here, because in this case, every single mountain is a specific peak drawn from a photo. I didn't have time to create a slide that labeled everything from K2 up by the Pamir's label all the way down through Dolagiri and everything to Everest, which is just above the Golden Lango monkey. Um, but yeah, they're all there. And I really like doing this because, um, well, as you draw from the unique characteristics of a landscape, the map can kind of start to feel closer to what I've always strived for, a living map that's filled with moments, that has emotional resonance. That's why it's wild world, not wild earth. I sort of see Earth as the physical planet, but the world is a broader concept, you know, with its stories and its inhabitants um, and the emotional resonance of its places. Uh, there's a living spirit to this Earth I'm trying to connect with whether or not I do successfully, I don't know, but I'm trying. Um, now, I initially hoped that Wild World would take six months. Uh, <laughs> 
And it, also just in Australia, there's lots of really wonderful landscapes to draw from. You can see Uluru and Katajuda in the in this centre there, the cliffs of the Nullarbor Plain. Just a little something from where I live. But yeah, I hoped it would take six months, but I quickly realised this was fantasy. And I was strapped in, there was no escaping this ride. I was like, on another ride. And so from July 2020 to July 2023, this map dominated my life. Uh, it required a vast breadth of research and thousands of hours of pencil drawing. Months and years went by and it was stunning in its intensity. Uh, it was difficult, required sacrifice, but I loved it. And that five-year-old boy obsessed with birds and maps, he, he was back and he was very happy, very satisfied. This was a passion project, at times uh, an obsession. Um, but exploring the world this way was, was magic. You know, animals I never dreamed existed were uh, introduced to me. Landscapes of incredible beauty were revealed to me. Um, and I do feel the, some of the most emotive maps are those that evoke a, a sense of place, that see location not just by their topography and hydrography and bathymetry, but what it feels like to be there, uh, by the colours and the sounds. And so places being quite sacred, part of who we are, um, this is what I always try to channel. Now, the last thing I drew on the map was the cartouche. I like to get carried away with cartouches. Um, there are opportunities to get creative when you're not so kind of tied to the dictates of a map. And I think my basic philosophy behind Wild World is sort of found inside this, this cartouche, hidden inside the cornucopia of animals and landscapes as a world map. Um, an illusion, an illusion that simply suggests if you look at nature, you'll see the world. Look to nature, see the world. Uh, I was standing on the Santa Monica Pier a few days ago, jet lagged, uh, taking in the feeling of a super city, because like LA is a place that feels very far away from the world that I'm presenting in this map. Um, but I was looking out at the Santa Monica Mountains, seeing them stretch into the, the sunset, and it was like, totally beautiful. And I, I imagined all the great mountains that enclose LA, uh, and the Pacific was rolling in just like it does in New Zealand. And hundreds of people were taking photos in the sunset, probably also thinking they're going to crop out the car park. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, even in the most urbanized places on Earth, the underlying nature shapes the culture, the experiences, the lives within. Nature comes first. Um, the animals and the land shape the culture. And of course, the culture then shapes the land. But as I flew over the San Bernardino Mountains the next morning, I saw the great grand backdrop to LA that dwarfs its skyscrapers. And um, that's the world I'm trying to focus on with this map. Just as Pittsburgh is shaped by the confluence of great rivers, I think everything's downstream of nature. Frank Lloyd Wright knew this. Uh, you know, and, and we are nature, let's not forget that either. Our imprint, all the stuff that we make has become so prominent, we've had to sort of define ourselves out of the concept of the natural world. Um, and fair enough, by some estimates, human-made mass now outweighs all natural biomass. So it's pretty crazy. But still, let's not forget, we are part of nature. We are animals, wandering the plains, the mountains, and the beaches, um, eating, sleeping, reproducing, living, dying, attending the occasional map conference. Uh, well, we are nature. Um, so, well, look, I'm going to finish up there. Uh, there's so much more I could tell you about the world. But let's finish on a slide of my home country of Aotearoa. Uh, thank you for having me.